Hello, and welcome to our October procurement talks. My name is Sarah Scudder, president of Real Sourcing Network. We help companies better manage their print and marketing services spend. And we are really, really focused on helping bring the procurement community together to collaborate and share ideas. So last year, we decided to do a trial with some of our favorite supplier partners and host some events. And they went so well that we decided to launch a full series this year. Our topic is train wrecks, nightmares, and meltdowns, tales of lessons learned. We actually came up with the topic last year, and it just happened to be super fitting and appropriate for 2020. So I want to take a few minutes to thank our sponsors for making this event possible and free for everyone to attend. And I'm going to ask each of them to say a couple words about how they're innovating. And some of our sponsors are doing some really, really cool things in their space. So with that, Brenton, I'm going to have you kick us off from um, looks like warm and sunny Southern California. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Always warm and sunny in San Diego. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Brent Walton. I'm the director here for Center Trade North America. I lead our sales and partnerships for North America. And, um, we are one of the, the larger source to pay suites here globally. And the interesting part we've been really working on is especially with the amount of work from home that everyone is is going through is really focusing on compliance. So the e invoicing, you know, contract management, and, and helping large organizations make that change so that you can have that audit trail, that compliance around being able to, to still purchase and work from home, and true strategic sourcing. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Brenton. My pleasure. All right, next we have Ken also joining us from SoCal. We've got the California group in the house today. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely enjoying the weather out here. It's, uh, it's, it's nice today. It's going to be a nice week. But yeah, hey, I'm Ken Bomerick from Worldwide Services. Um, <clears throat> what we do here at Worldwide is provide instant savings. And when I say that, we, we're, we're focusing on the IT infrastructure world, the servers, the storage. We buy, sell, and mostly maintain the legacy type equipment that's out there. But one of the real nice things that we're doing is we've partnered with a company called GRMS, um, and they are a global risk management solution that actually proactively monitors your suppliers to see how their health uh, in this condition in this world is 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 reoccurring right now. And it's a very very great solution. It's actually free to you guys where we work with the suppliers for a uh, monthly charge. But it might be something um, worthwhile for you guys. Um, but we can talk about it later, but yeah, thanks for having me on this today, Sarah, and let's, uh, let's go. All right. Thanks, Ken. Next, we have Eric joining us from Rapid Ratings from New York and Eric, love the banner. You've got a new background today. Thanks. I look like a cartoon here. I don't know if I quite I look a little funky, but, um, <laughs> I configured the zoom last week and I'm like, oh man, that's still on. So thanks, Sarah. Um, Glad to join, be a sponsor, and at Rapid Ratings, we're um, glad to foster, help foster, you know, the conversation here with, with all the great experience and background of the procurement folks that join. And, you know, we're a SaaS-based algorithmic system for um, our clients to, to really hone in and look at financial health on their public and private company suppliers, so very predictive early warning signal, which Turns out everyone needed, you know, obviously um, our clients were lucky, you know, prior to COVID to, to have it in place. And then they've only increasingly, you know, used it to go uh, look at more suppliers. So um, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right, again, big thanks to our sponsors for making this event possible. Now we are going to kick off uh, the main uh, part of our event today, which is our panel. Again, our theme is talking about some of those absolutely crazy wild experiences that people have had in their careers. And most importantly, what are some of the lessons that we can all learn from these professionals and take away so we don't necessarily make the same mistakes or we have better insight as we're dealing with some of the, the craziness that's happening this year. 
A couple housekeeping notes at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat and Q&A function. So feel free to engage in chat. We like to have lively, fun conversations. So keep that going throughout. And then we do want to encourage questions. You can either put your question in the Q&A or in the chat function. You can direct your question to a specific panelist or you can post a general question and our moderator Dicey will direct those to the panelists. So with that, I am going to introduce our moderator and then she is going to kick off the panel discussion today. So we at RSN are not big on really long, boring bios. We like to keep things kind of fun. So we are going to do some fun facts about Dicey. So she used to be a flight attendant at Delta and she hopes that the new sanitizing measures are here to stay. So I'm very curious to hear some of her crazy stories um, being a flight attendant. Dicey survived half of a German winter, moved to Munich in July and left in January after a very, very cold white November and December. And this one's my favorite. She works in technology, but her husband even doesn't even know how to use Excel or Google Sheets. So I, I'm wondering if that makes Dicey a bit of a hypocrite. So with that, Dicey, I am going to turn the panel over to you um, to if there's anything else you want to share about yourself, and then we can kick off our conversation. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I'm actually really excited about this conversation. Um, we've got some discussions that are I've kind of grouped into digital and tech, which, as you just said, that's my that's my sweet spot. I love it. There's so much going on right now, even as we saw with um, our sponsors, everything that they're doing to really digitalize um, on the procurement side, I mean, supply chain, everything. Um, I don't know if it makes me a hypocrite. I've tried with the, you know, I've tried with the Google Sheets. I've tried with the Excel. He is starting to learn. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm also down here in sunny SoCal. So it's great weather. And um, as you guys, I'm sure you saw my, my assistant made his entrance. So <laughs> nap time was an hour ago and he's still here pushing through. <laughs> um, so I am actually ready to, you know, go ahead and get started with, um, with our first panelist. Um, I'm going to kick off a digitalization and tech question to you, Thomas. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. What is your worst possible nightmare when you start to launch uh, a digitalization project? Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. So um, frankly speaking, when you go into digitalization and investments, there is a whole list of nightmares that can really happen. Um, so I listed a few one here. So try to picture this, right? So I'm, if you ha you probably have been through this. So you um, internally, your, your leadership um, is asking you to consider a digital program. It can be a source to pay. It can be um, a solution for risk management. It can be invoicing. It can really be anything. And uh, step by step, uh, you build that story. Um, and yeah, you need to sell the story, right? So you're selling it, it goes well, you go through the uh, RFI, you go through the RFP, months pass by, and probably once you start to have the overall um, picture of the market, the pricing, uh, you, you make your uh, decision proposals, and you're probably one year later when all that happened, right? So it's, it's a long process, um, and um, maybe not a nightmare yet, but... Uh, it's uh, certainly many levels of frustrations. You come to the decision and now you feel good, finally it's happening. The first night, small nightmare is coming saying that finance knocks at your door and says, you know what, I don't really understand what you're doing, can you explain it to me again? And then shortcuts get made, right? Financials get increased, expectation get increased, timelines get shortened, and um, yeah, you're, you're kind of wondering wh where is this leading? Um, that takes courage at that point to try to to limit that. But at the same time, everybody wants to move on. And in a world of procurement, you're not the first one who gets the money, right? Revenue always gets the money. R&D gets the money. And in general, most corporations, the one who gets the money is number four or five. So you say, you know what? I just do it. 
but you know that you're already on a on a, on a shaky ground. Now, as those um, as it goes along, the teams get get put build, build together. On very often, you have integration teams, you have consultants, and you have the and for, even from the inside, they are cross functionals. Teams they don't understand each other. They uh, they 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 have different expectations, different skill sets. Um, this another not nightmare yet, but it's a bad dream, right? Saying how you get all that together, how you create that team, how do you put them together, and everybody's running different things. People are criticizing each other. Uh, what do you do? As it goes along, um, the the difficulty then is all the expectations. Now you're supposed to to create a digital solution and then people have who are surrounding you the stakeholders most often they're saying oh it will be ai or it will all be automated or i don't need to do really anything anymore it just comes to me uh, in a very uh, easy way and that's not really the case so now the next bad dream comes in saying okay how do i communicate that what we try to explain reasonably to sell People heard something else, and really there's a huge disconnect between the expectation of deliverables versus what you will build. Now, the transformation kicks in, and the transformation management is that everybody doesn't have, so if you don't have a transformation uh, group, uh, it gets much worse because now all the emotional intelligence is not managed. It's purely hardcore process, which... We all know that doesn't bring you very far, and the and if you have one, um, now you ha- you you wake up all the emotions in everybody, and um, the next bad dream comes into play, saying, okay, how do you manage and 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 do all those um, all those um, uh, emotion management in a transformation journey? And um, as those things go along, now you start to see that the budgets are not really respected. You have the software costs, you have the integration cost, you have the transformation cost, and everything that was not really said, it was understood, but as it probably, as most of us, one of our first files, even one or two, where you start to discover that certain things were assumed, but you didn't build it in. Now the budget goes south. Now you have to go back to finance and say, you know, we have not started yet, but we just discovered that there are several hundreds of thousands of dollars that were not really planned um, so it, you're still on the on the wrong path, right? And here's the, the big thing. The big thing is that certainly somehow you make it work. Somehow all that goes along. But what people underestimate is the negative reactions of what you're building. And now those who you didn't really manage come out of the woods and come start to criticize that. Oh, this is not working look how long it is the expectation is not there and it just creates this huge noise cross organizations it goes up to the c-suite the c-suite says it's true why is it so much noise was not supposed to be like that it was to be an easy project and i have seen it at least two or three times in my last 10 years where i have been doing this the ceo steps in and says i unplug everything write everything off, millions of dollars, millions, get written off, everybody goes home, project is full stopped. Too much noise in the corridor was not sustainable. That's my worst nightmare. (laughs) And why don't you tell us a little bit about your background as to why you have all of these years of experience and these stories and tips and tricks for us um, as it relates to these nightmares. Well, I was um, leading a traditional procurement organization on the direct and indirect side in several industries, in the chemical industry, in the flavor and fragrances, and telecom, and now in, in the tech industry. Um, and um, at the end, it's, 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 uh, it's procurement. Um, we still live in a very conservative world, uh, even if lately it has uh, tremendously uh, changed. The startups have really changed the world. Um, and, um, yeah, so I think, uh, by 2025, many things will change. Many platforms will be launched. Uh, startups will uh, probably take over the big, uh, the big companies, uh, from the solution perspective. And, um, for many companies, it will be too late. They, they will, they still figure out where's my savings. I, I pay people to make savings. 
but they don't realize that most of the business will go through platforms and you don't need buyers. But there's a very different perspective of how you source and and the pricing maybe is not the most important uh, when all that will happen. So. Thanks so much for that, Thomas. Um, so I am going to kick off the next question um, to Jaina. And let's stick with, you know, kind of what Thomas has been talking about with the software and the technology. Um, you know, give us a little introduction before you answer your question and then give us some, you know, pointers or tips and tricks about, uh, you know, software and technology, just kind of following up on what Thomas was talking about. Hi everyone, thank you. Gianna Rival here. Um, yes, there's a lot to be said about the complexity of software and hardware negotiations. And there's so many facets of the deal, such as, is it on-prem, off-prem? How many realms do I need? How many sandboxes? I'm not here to talk about those particulars today, but the one that always gets muddy, which is the imposed timeline the suppliers put on us to sign the deal. Now, I was groomed in non-production, so the IT rules um, became very interesting to me. I was groomed to believe as a sourcing person, I called the shots, I called the when, I called the where during negotiations. That's never true in software and hardware buys. Now, why is this? It's because software companies, hardware companies, and that sales guy are after one thing, and it's called revenue recognition. For a corporation, that means I need to meet the street's expectations of my revenue. Very important. And for the sales guy, I need that Jag. I need that Ferrari. So you have two forces working against you. Now I can tell you in um, my tenure, um, I've had scenarios where the papers flipped to me, sign the deal, or my team had to sign the deal. And we knew in our guts, there was more benchmarking we could have done. We could have put it to bed. We didn't have that opportunity. The need was right then and there. And this timeline gave us no flexibility. It happens. Now I can also tell you, there's been scenarios where I had great stakeholder alignment and we, we walked away. Unheard of. The poor sales guy called me crying in the, in the lobby. I can't believe you pulled my deal. Sorry, I have great alignment with my stakeholder and we don't believe that this is the best you can do. And we iced it. Needless to say, a couple, Months later, we came back to the table and we got a fair, what we felt was a fair deal. The third one, I just wanna tell you, it's very rare they extend that date and still get it in with one or two days after their fiscal close. So how do you avoid some of this tension? You're already worried about driving savings, but now you gotta do it in a time frame that's sometimes very difficult. The first thing I wanna recommend is always know your supplier's fiscal year end so you can back in quarter ends. You can easily Google it. What is the fiscal year of Oracle? If you have a partner like Gartner, they lay it out really pretty. And back into your planning cycle from a procurement standpoint, when you need to get with that stakeholder to say, hey, what are you, up, what are you what's upcoming that I can get involved in now and not have my back against a wall? As I was saying, stakeholder alignment is very important. Know the demand. Part of our job is demand management, understanding when we can come in and serve our support. Three, change, train the supplier. Most of the time you get the same sales guy, train him. You can't send anything to anyone else in the org without CCing my team. It's repetitive. That way, if you have a stakeholder that's not always a board keeping you updated, you have the supplier on your side to know what's going through. You have to command that respect. And fourth, that sales guy, as much as you don't wanna like him, he can be your friend and he can be very useful. But one of the things you need to know is most of the time those guys are not empowered or have the delegation to actually negotiate. So make sure you know that when you are in the thick of it, is the person at the table have the delegation to actually negotiate. Now, in some cases, as procurement, you're in a train wreck, the paper came over, you have to push it. Two things I wanna remind you to do. One, 99% of any software or hardware, hardware deal is a multiple year deal. Make sure you have a provision in there that you can annually true up, 
because most of the time, especially in new deals, you don't know how many of this license or how many of that. And so after you have a little bit of run rate, you want the ability to be flexible. That didn't save money on the unit price, but it does in the long end to give you flexibility to work with a deal. Maybe you didn't construct the way you wanted optimally. Lastly, always remember, especially on these hot deals that turn, the pumpkin turns on midnight. That next second, you're already being started to be billed for all those licenses. If it's a new product, try to get some ramp up time because day one, not all 108 licenses are gonna be used. It's gonna ramp as you um, get the system stood up. Um, so in closing, uh, remember, even the fairy godmother couldn't impact time and neither can you when it comes to this category. Thank you, Dicey. Thanks so much for sharing um, all of that great information. And one point that we are seeing here in the chat is also making sure that we know and align our suppliers' fiscal calendars and use it to our advantage. So that was a good takeaway. I have a question. You talked about stakeholder alignment, which I think is absolutely key um, in terms of just any type of transformation, any type of project, any type of change. And you mentioned CCing people to make sure that they know what's going on, even though it might seem repetitive and redundant. What are some other ways that you have experienced being able to make sure that there is stakeholder alignment? Do you have like a certain meeting cadence that you follow? How do you determine who needs to be at the table and who those stakeholders are? What are some tips you can provide there? Um, great. That's a great question, Lacey. One of the things that I felt brought my team success is we tried to co-locate with the stakeholder. What does that mean? In the days when we would go to the office, I would tell them, go sit near them, have a desk near them. Ask the, the senior leader if you could sit in their staff meeting. It allows more transparency into the day-to-day -day activities. It also gives you a little perspective of what stress are they feeling in the system to, to change or create change or bring transformation around. So I really think it starts there and then you become part of their team versus an afterthought. And when you're part of the team, you're always more successful with collaboration than if you're just another member sitting in a different building. Okay, I am going to pivot to that point with stakeholders and kind of go off of this um, relationships and keeping people at the table, kind of co-locating. And I want to head over to um, Michelle and I want to talk about relationships between the suppliers and buyers. Um, so give us a little introduction and then um, let us know how you work through that, managing relationships between suppliers and buyers, and then even, you know, within your team managing um, those different dynamics. Hi, everyone. Sorry, that unmute button. There it is. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle Wessling, and I work for TD Securities. Um, which is in the financial uh, financial institutions, one of the financial institutions we're in the capital markets business. So when you think about trade floors um, and uh, investment banking, that's primarily what we're looking at. Um, it's interesting when you talk about relationships because you know I do have a story that I'll I'll, I'll tell in a sec that I know Jane is going to be able to relate to based on her story. But I think for us, I believe in a win-win. I believe in a partnership. Um, you know, you can't have that with every single one of your suppliers, but you sort of need to pick who are your big, who are the ones that really can influence your business and, and do. You sit at the table with them. You work through things with them as problems. So when it does come time to source solutions, they're already engaged because the odds are good, usually with those large suppliers, that that's where you're going to go to. And I'll tell you about a time early on in my career where I actually learned about this. Um, I was assigned very at, at early on, as I said, I was not seasoned at that point um, to manage a couple of our largest strategic vendors. And this was with another firm. And one of those vendors was IBM. So you don't get any bigger than IBM back then. And so you talk about managing relationships. Um, I had, we had them on site. So very similar. They had an office on site and I had, you know, weekly meetings with the relationship manager to see how things were going. 
um, things started to bubble up from the execs down to me um, within because we were waiting for them to deliver a service that they had promised that we would have and it was enabling one of our projects and the execs were starting to get impatient. So they called me in to do, you know, what quite often we get called to do, which is performance issue resolution. The part of our job, none of us like, because it doesn't let us be the nicer side of ourselves. Um, but it always is the part that our businesses really enjoy us doing because they get to keep their wonderful BAU relationships intact. So I was meeting with the um, IBM relationship manager almost every other day talking about this because it had turned into that type of a performance issue. And I was getting nowhere after a couple of weeks. And, and I started to get really frustrated. And most people who know me know that I'm usually very fair and, and very upbeat. But I got the, the, the not so nice Michelle showed up um, to the last meeting that we had together. <laughs> And I don't like her when she has to show up, but every now and then she has to come to the party. So, and, and so I took a strip off of him that kind of, he walked out of my office like nothing. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm done. So I escalated to his manager. Um, and that conversation, I didn't think went very well. Uh, from the perspective of getting me any type of action. But at the same time, I thought, you know what, just in case, I resonated. I need to go to my exec and let them know that this conversation has taken place. So I wasn't, um, so I did. I didn't want him to get smacked in the back of the head with that one. And what happened next, I did not anticipate, nor did I know about until the end of the story. But what happened was my exec had picked up the phone and called their peer within IBM just to reinforce the dialogue that I had had with the manager. So the next day was our next meeting, myself and the relationship manager. And I have to tell you, you have to picture this, okay? So I'm sitting in a little 10 by 10 office, desk sort of in the middle, my chair on one side of the desk, two chairs on the other side of the desk for people to come and meet. And all of a sudden, the relationship manager shows up in my office door for our meeting. And I said, hi, come on in, sit down. And then a parade, literally a parade of IBM folks were following him into my office. There was 10 of them at the end. You can imagine them trying to meet in there. And I have to admit, I was a wee bit flustered. So I said, guys, wait here. I excused myself and I went more to compose myself, but also to check the boardroom to see if it was empty, which it was. Hustled them into the boardroom and we sat down um, to meet and had some open dialogue. I was shocked at how, how the dialogue had changed and how open it became and that we actually sat down for the next hour and carved out a plan. They had brought the right specialist into the room so we could talk about timelines and and. and figure out when we could expect to get this new service. Um, and, and that was it. It went, it went positive from that point on. So, you know, my sort of moral to this story is, tr first of all, be fearless in your conversations. And second of all, escalate when you know it's appropriate to do so. Now, you never want to be the little boy that calls wolf, but you want to know when to go up, when there is power, in those that are higher up than you in an organization and where they have more influence and then bring them in and you'll get to the right result. But that's, you know, my little tale to tell you guys on, on when to graciously accept support um, and, and, and drive the result. So Dana, I hope that resonated with you based on your conversation. <laughs> Now, I have a quick question, um, just kind of following up on something that you you mentioned. Um, so we know we want to start off on the right foot with our uh, the right foot with our relationships. Um, and you mentioned having weekly meetings. So in addition to starting off on the right foot, once you start that relationship, you mentioned, you know, wanting to have like your strategic partnerships and things like that. How do you kind of in an ongoing, consistent way, make sure that you're managing that relationship? You get started on the right foot. 
or even maybe you don't, but you need to pivot. But how do you make sure that if you're going to have a relationship with your partners? I mean, we've seen over the past couple of months that the organizations that were able to kind of remain resilient in these times, they continuously said we have really good supplier relationships. Um, so what are some tips that you've learned to make sure that you're being gracious, you're being firm, like you're you're balancing all of these different um, kind of what would seem like competing objectives to manage a good relationship? I think you just got to be real. You got to be authentic to who you are. Um, and, you know, quite often when it, it, I like to entrench those vendors right in the business. So um, have them talking to the people that they're providing services to. So we have with one of our vendors, we have a monthly meeting um, where we bring all of tech together to have a conversation with them and the tech heads. And, and we plan out that conversation to the point now the vendor provides us with the agenda because they're so invested in the outcome of that meeting. And then I think the other thing is, is, is when you're the person who's sort of accountable for the relationship across the whole organization, that's where I say be real and just be who you are. Because if you think about it, when you're in a difficult conversation with them, if you manage that authentically, they'll know that you're having a difficult conversation. Whereas if you're at a friendly time, Again, you manage that the way you would normally. Again, you, you build that relationship. So I think it's really just being who you are. Like I said to you guys, there are times where I actually say to my vendor, okay, you're not going to get the pretty version of me today because guess what? I'm annoyed. And they know right away when I say that, it's like, oh boy, okay. And, and they actually, I think if you're human with them, they're human with you. So when you're upset with them, they don't want to upset you as a person as well as as that relationship manager. Now, you you talked about um, you know, kind of a line across the organization just now in that answer. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a famous proverb that I think we all know it takes a village to raise a child. So kind of going along that theme, um, in direct sourcing, most of times it takes a village to get a product to market successfully. So have you ever experienced a time when a lack of internal coordination across your organization um, caused just a complete train wreck, something that you were not expecting? And what are some tips and tricks we can give to avoid that? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's funny because uh, there's so many stories, I think, where we can look internally and sort of say, oh, that could have gone a whole lot better. But there was one time, um, again, early on in my career, where I had, fish I had switched from fashion to hard goods. And so here I am working with a team sourcing power tools. Um, I just seem to have been across all categories, indirect and direct sourcing through my career. But this one was um, the biggest miss, I think, of my whole career. And that's why it comes to mind. So when you think of power tools, think of things like drills and circular saws, the real deal. So you can imagine Father's Day, biggest season, right? So bigger than Christmas when it comes to power tools. And a funny thing is, is now it's Mother's Day as well as Father's Day, but then it was Father's Day. And so think of a team. If you imagine a team that consists of three individuals accountable for the power tool assortment for a major department store, a major store, um, the buyer who makes all the major decisions like price, marketing campaigns, and what vendors they're going to source from. And then there's a buyer's assistant who actually informs the buyer of things like landed costs, does all the back-end stuff, makes sure the photos of the product are accurate. And then there is the supply chain analyst. So back then, that was me. I was the supply chain analyst. And for anyone who has sourced anything like power tools, they're offshore. So your lead times are extremely long. And um, it comes across in a container on a ship. And God help you, that ship sinks. I'm just saying there's... <laughs> 
lots of complications there. And apparently there's a lot of power tools on the bottom of the ocean. I'm, I'm just letting you know. But anyway, um, so what had happened is in the 11th hour, the cost, the landed cost of one of the tools dropped significantly. And so what ended up happening is the buyer said, I'm going to introduce a new sale price in the Father's Day flyer. Forgot to tell the supply chain analyst. So, and, and just to give you an idea of the significance of the price, we're all shoppers, so we'll get this. It regularly re retailed for $129.99. The lowest sale price that it had ever been on before was $79.99. We were now going to market at $49.99 on Father's Day. <laughs> so, what what you can imagine the demand and the store that um, I was working for at the time actually re produced rain checks, which meant if we ran out of stock, you got a rain check and that was honored for up to a year for you to get the product at that price. So uh, needless to say, we sold out on the first day of the flyer. Um, and of course I caught how I caught the price change was through the system not through a communication. So I quickly looked and went, what's going on? Had a conversation, ordered some, but we were still 120 days lead time after that. So that's three months. So it took us six months to satisfy the demand from that one flyer based on that spike. And that's just a lack of internal communication. Had the buyer come to me at the time, which by the way, every time after he was going to lower price, he did. But had he come to me and said, this is what I'm thinking of doing, I would have told him he didn't have enough product. Wait, <laughs> do it at Christmas and I'll get the product here. So it's a perfect example of how a single decision made in isolation without engaging your team and putting together everyone's thoughts on that decision can cause a huge impact to your customer. So that's my sort of it takes a village story. <laughs> That is so relevant. Um, I, I think that what we have been seeing a lot of, or maybe in my world, what I have been hearing and seeing a lot of is um, really getting out of silos, collaborating. Um, and I think that we still haven't quite nailed down exactly what that looks like. People want to collaborate more. People want to have more conversations. I think we want to all work in that village, but we're still working out the kinks. Um, so, you know, what, what I do in my day to day as part of like helping organizations go through these transformations is taking stories like that and saying like, look, you can't just make this decision without telling anyone else because you end up not being able to execute on, you know, in this case, a promotion. Um, but I'd like to pose that question, you know, to, to all of the panelists. I, I'm sure that everyone has, you know, uh, a type of story, either from personal experience or even just um, a story that they've heard from someone else. Um, what, about, um, what about you, Thomas? Do you have a similar experience of, you know, these planning our decisions happening in silos and then having to um, having to go through and figure out how to um, how to rectify the the issue um, so also as you guys just saw um, before you start answering that Thomas we have a poll up and as all the panelists are kind of going through and telling us some of these horror stories <laughs> um, just go ahead and answer the question and then Brandon will uh, take a couple minutes and go through the results for us yeah so, so I <laughs> Yeah, so when, when this, the story that uh, Michelle was explaining, uh, the relation between procurement and planning, right? I mean, there, are, there for sure, I'm sure there are many, many stories, but 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 for sure, the 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 difficulty really that uh, very often procurement is in is that uh, it's quite rare that you have a procurement uh, linked directly to planning. Um, that it's very, that two different silos, two different career paths. And, uh, and most often the, the, the volumes come in. Uh, if you're dealing with direct sourcing, you might have a link uh, into, uh, into, the, into the planning section and risk management and so on. But if you're on the indirect side, and if you're in a mature organization, very often you 
the buyers, they set up contracts. They don't really care about the volume. That's something where the source to pay takes care about it. And uh, that is a life in its own there. Uh, actually, when you hire a strategic source and people, the first thing they will tell you is that I don't want to be part of any planning. I just want to make deals. Um, and, uh, and there is a clear disconnect, I think, between the, the procurement world and the planning world. And I'm really hoping that on the AI front and the technologies that are progressing here, that those silos get, get broken down, uh, broken down, and and that uh, we will see a, a much more harmonious way to to see those things for business decisions. But for sure, it will drastically challenge the job descriptions that uh, organizations have in place today. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I, I again digital and tech, I definitely think that as we start to use more technology and we revisit these processes, that we'll definitely get there. Um, what about you, Jana? Do you have a story for us? Yeah, I mean, I think the the key is goes back to the same um, vibe that I said before. It's about stakeholder collaboration. And in most of my career has been in indirect, so I didn't have a real planning, but we did in another way, in that the indirect side of the business is still accountable to drive value continuously. And so part of our planning pipeline was understanding the budgeting process, the activity, what spend could we actually touch and impact to drive value. Um, and sometimes uh, there's not that transparency in which we lose an opportunity. So again, to carry on with the theme, you know, it really is understanding who your colleagues are, who your partners are, and together uniting to solve a common goal, which is drive the best value for the company. Best value for the company. I like that. Driving value, really focusing on value um, as it relates to relates like a holistic view. Um, and then Sadar, what about you? So before you answer that, give us an introduction um, to yourself, what you do, and then, um, you know, maybe some tips and tricks that you have found to really drive collaboration and break down silos or, you know, a story that you can share with us um, where you were, um, maybe it wasn't a horror story, um, but it was actually something successful that you were able to um, to implement. Uh, great. Yeah. Thanks, Daisy. And before I start, you know, thanks, Sarah and Arasan for the opportunity as well uh, to be in this awesome panel. So my name is Siddharth Ramesh. I work for VSD Global. I uh, head up uh, our uh, strategic sourcing travel program and our supply diversity program here. Uh, so quite a handful and, you know, keeps me uh, busy here. Uh, I mean, awesome panel discussion so far, right? In fact, I was, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, how do we, uh, you know, kind of take this to the next level and talk about kind of, you know, talent and, you know, hiring and uh, maintaining talent because, you know, all of these are like, you know, functions that we described within procurement, but needs to be done uh, and executed effectively by uh, a strong team. And if you don't have that team, then, uh, uh, you know, all of these, you know, like nice to have things will be only on paper, right? So, uh, you know, to kind of like, you know, summarize, you know, from uh, from our discussion here, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, most important, uh, you know, from a talent and, you know, perspective, you know, standpoint is, uh, is if we can, you know, get, uh, get someone with the right technical skills, the technical acumen, the adaptability to learn all these, you know, digital tools that are being, you know, thrown in front of, you know, sourcing and procurement, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, most essential. And I've had uh, some challenges uh, very recently, even this year, I've had, you know, to hire or, you know, backfill, you know, three positions across various different levels, a buyer, a senior buyer, a category manager, and uh, especially the category manager role, I'm um, having significant challenges just getting, you know, the right talent in. Uh, uh, you, you would think, you know, we have a distributed workforce this year, might be easier to actually, you know, go out and, uh, you know, recruit for talent, you know, almost nationwide. Uh, but then it's like, you know, you get, you get like, you know, either folks that are like extremely uh, qualified that, you know, I unfortunately cannot afford the budget for, or, you know, there is the lack of, you know, kind of, you know, skills and, you know, the requirements to be an effective category manager. So I'm going through that 
kind of i wouldn't say a horror show but yeah it it does give me nightmares sometimes is the ability to not you know fill a role quickly because as most of you know you know procurement is not uh, it's always a, a lean organization uh, and uh, the and whenever you have a gap it just means that someone else on the team is like you know pulling that load uh, and you know it causes you know burnout and this year has been you know uh, totally unusual atypical to say the least and we've had a lot of you know challenges in terms of just maintaining team morale and bandwidth and you know things like that so i'm you know fingers crossed here hoping that we you know we can kind of you know fill that role and and uh, you know move on uh, from a recruiting standpoint uh, but then again yeah even just you know building a strong team right so going back to you know how thomas was saying you know to have all the digital you know kind of skills and acumen to uh, be effective in this role but uh, also separately you know category knowledge and expertise is never going to go away yeah, you still need your technology folks to you know have a pulse on all of your you know tech suppliers you know kind of like what jana mentioned around you know fiscal years and you know uh, things to you know watch out for you need to have your marketing category team you know focus on what's happening you know in the media space in the print space understand you know are there other you know suppliers channels that we can effectively partner with to drive more value in that category you know similarly you know with facilities uh, real estate hr all these you know different indirect categories uh, right uh, in fact i actually joke with my team yes from a title standpoint they have you know like buyer senior buyer category manager but effectively everybody is like a sourcing advisor right so we have to partner with uh, all of our business this goes back to you know jana's point around not only building uh, relationships internally you know so you have to build relationships with uh, your suppliers make sure that you know you develop real good expertise around influencing your stakeholders so a strong category manager has to you know kind of cover all of this and you know the best part is you know none of this is like rocket science but uh, these are all things that can't be also like you know taught somewhere in a course you have to be on the job you have to go through that process uh, it's kind of like you know um, uh, molding you know hot iron and you know type of thing you know go through that you know grueling uh, process but on out of it you know you come you come up with uh, Uh, a, a good end product uh, and so uh, you know just kind of like summarizing i think you know there, there is going to be you know challenges maintaining um, uh, uh, a good sourcing team retaining talent as well as continuously looking at what's happening in the market and how do we respond to that uh, but i think that's where you know the the uh, kind of uh, i i guess uh, the uh the juice is you know kind of you know worth the squeeze type thing where you know it's it's uh, it's what makes uh leading in procurement also you know a, a fun aspect it's it's always going to be challenging as we compete uh with and for resources that uh, you know kind of would want to you know sit in the business as well back to you daisy Actually, I'm going to weigh in if it's okay so dark cuz um right. talent you're right like the i find when you're going to recruit the street is pretty dry it's because all of the good people are working for great companies um and to try and entice them to leave well is that really the right thing to do and and so i find that finding talent is one of the hardest things that we face as procurement leaders and i've started to spin it a little bit differently to say if i can't have a seasoned professional what do i want and then and then you start to open up the possibility because there's a lot of transferable skills in things that people do every in other other roles that transfer to procurement like i was for a stint a project manager and i feel blessed that i've had that experience coming into you know leading a a large rfp because i know how to keep it on track and on the rails and then also looking at if you can't have someone who really understands a category what about if you had somebody who really understood your business and the business that you were sourcing for so if you could find some you know someone with a great business acumen internally that maybe had a bit of a project management background so they've possibly worked with vendors before or someone who operationally works BAU with a bunch of your vendors cuz they provide services to them 
I've started to groom those folks and, and actually kind of entice them internally to say, you know, have you ever thought about moving to vendor management and what that would look like? Those conversations have to start long before you're putting a posting up because it really takes a lot to get these folks to think about themselves in that role. But it's, it's kind of interesting when you start to just spin it on its head and think about what are the skills I need? What is the knowledge that I need really to have someone effectively roll in? Because if you buddy them once they land with one of your strongest category managers, you've, you've won. You've, you've got a huge win because, you know, what we do, yeah, there's a lot of art and science to it, but it, it can be learned. It isn't an inherent thing. So just food for thought. Um, yeah, great, great point. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I'll have to say one of our uh, uh, hires that we made this year actually came internal. So we had, uh, you know, someone to, you know, kind of, you know, help out with marketing sourcing projects. We actually went to uh, kind of our meetings and events team. They're having a rough year, obviously, because of, you know, all the stuff that's happening. But there was this events planner that was super interested within procurement, had her chat with a bunch of, you know, folks with our, within our team. And she said, okay, you know, I'm on the event side. Why don't I just come over here? And, you know, with my kind of, you know, background in media and events and things like that, kind of, you know, help in that space. So that thing looks to be uh, kind of like a, you know, um, a home run, at least for now. And, you know, hopefully, you know, that will continue this trend of, you know, looking internally. Great point, Michelle. Yeah, we've got a lot of action down here in the chat also um, from Thomas. Uh, he just loves the idea of a sourcing advisor, um, changing the, the title of sourcing advisor instead of category manager. Um, Brandon mentioned um, how personality probably really plays a big role um, in talking about relationship skills that are required in procurement. So your extroverts might really like that piece of it. Um, but we also heard, you know, digital and tech skills that are going to be needed. So, you know, maybe your data science people and kind of your tech um nerds as Brandon called them would, would really like that um looking for talent I am here Nella says um and, and to that point you know I've actually had a couple of conversations um over the past couple of months of younger people asking you know how can I get into supply chain um or even people looking to make career changes um so I myself just for the past couple of months have wanted to learn more about the procurement and sourcing side of supply chain. You know, I always like to think of myself of sitting, you know, that 30, that, that 30,000 level, um, 30,000 foot level of looking at the end to end to supply chain and how everything is connected. And when you think about all of the different pieces, you know, I said, well, I want to learn more about procurement and, and sourcing. So I've been trying to um, tell people you should look into procurement, but then I'm like, well, I don't really know what that looks like. But what we have, you know, through the last 10 minutes or so, we've really, you know, in my mind, as you guys have been talking, I'm like, oh, well, that's a consultant. Oh, well, that's project management, as Michelle mentioned. Or, oh, that's a salesperson, you know, relationship management. So it seems like there is this mixing of skills that are needed. And to Michelle's point, I don't think it's necessarily something that we just have innately, you know, innately. A lot of things um, we have to learn how to do. I think it's a learned skill to be able to, um, you know, be stern, but be nice and keep your position, but also, you know, it's a give and a take, recognizing, you know, when to um, say, okay, you know, I, I don't believe that, you know, that this is going to, this deal is going to turn into a pumpkin as, you know, Jaina talked to us about, um, but, you know, not also wanting to miss the deal because we do want to get those cost savings. So there are just so many different skills that it seems like, you um, need to be balanced. And uh, I think that going, you know, internally, as you guys have mentioned, could be a good idea. Um, but also, I'm interested to hear uh, at, at what point you kind of start to look to um, 
you know, someone else, because it, 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 what it's what it's giving me um, what I'm thinking about is we see these job posts that say X years of experience, but maybe the X years of experience, I might look at it and say, oh, well, I've never done procurement before, but maybe I've done a job that has all these other transferable skills. So um, for people like Nella who are looking for, um, you know, different roles in procurement and sourcing, what kind of tips would you give them for that? I'm happy to take that one. I'm happy to take that one. <laughs> so I, um, I ex, experience, you need to define experience, right? And, and let's face it, getting a job is selling yourself. If anyone thinks that something's just going to land in your lap these days, it's not going to happen. You need to network like crazy. You need to be constantly saying, you know, what your differentiators are, why you, why you, why you. So the five years of experience, you can paint that with any color brush. Just make it sound relevant. So if you've been doing, I mean, technically, if you're, you know, for, if it's direct sourcing as a customer, you've got experience. Indirect, maybe not so much, but <laughs> so I would suggest that that just get colorful in your dialogue and and make sure that you're calling out what experience you believe that you have is relative to the role versus you know titles and jobs. Because you'd be surprised how much experience you get, you know, over a number of different roles that is relevant to the world of procurement. What about you, Thomas? Do you want to weigh in? Um, what, what would your sourcing advisor um, job post look like? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is really a subject that uh, I really love, right? Because it's kind of interesting. I have young people very early career out of college or maybe five years of experience who come to see me and saying, how can I get a job in procurement and supply chain, but I don't have the experience and I don't have that. Then you have people who are very seasoned, 30 years plus, and who have a lot of experience. And they say, you know what, I, I would like to, um, to, uh, to continue to work in the arena of uh, procurement or supply chain, or just would like to enter it. Um, but I have so many years experience elsewhere that I don't get accepted either. So for me, the, the, I think it's all about the energy. You can feel in people the energy to do something, right? And the other aspect is that uh, there are so many classes and certifications you can do, uh, even if, as Michelle is saying, they don't need to be directly related to uh, category management, if you want. But they can go in, in, in different aspects. And procurement became very rich nowadays. You have the compliance, you have the audits, you have process, you have technology, you have negotiations and legal and so on. And there's more and more and more. Without talking about diversity and sustainability, which is tremendously growing lately. So you can really, I, I think there's a wrong perception of procurement where you have to save money and you're a category manager and there's nothing else out there. That's a very wrong perception. Unfortunately, um, in the US, there is no procurement school. And I have never heard one. Uh, you can see supply chain school, you can see planning school, you go to Europe, you have it in, in France, you have it in England, you have it in, in Holland, in Geneva. Um, it's very surprising at the country like in the US, there is, there is certifications. But if uh, somebody who goes to college and says, I want to graduate from a business school majored in procurement, I have never seen one. <laughs> And why do you guys think that is? I'm, I'm curious um, since, you know, everyone has said that retaining talent, that getting talent recruiting, even in the chat, you know, people are saying that is a really big challenge right now. Um, so why do you think it is that people don't say, oh, I'm going to go study procurement or I want to go into procurement after graduating? Um, I, I would think that it is just due to kind of a lack of what I would call marketing, you know, on the part of procurement professionals, maybe to, um, you know, younger people as they're starting to identify what types of roles they would be interested in. So they don't know, you know, how fun and rewarding it might be. Um, Jaina, what do you think about that? Do you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, I think it's a little mix of still there's some 
um, for lack of better words, growth that procurement needs to do within organizations themselves. We've always been kind of a second thought. Supply chain for manufacturing, high on the list, but for the indirect categories, it's almost an afterthought until the, the, the CFO decides oh, we need more help with the bottom line. So I think that there's just in general, the take is a little bit sometimes slower in our world. Um, and yet the value we bring to the table is exponential. Um, I think um, to make a good point, one of the things that I wanted to share it with my career, I made a mistake and said, I just want to stay in indirects. I never went into a supply chain role. Big mistake because every role you have within our craft teaches you something and you bring it to the next role and you learn from it and you develop it. So even though supply chain is what's out there, we recruited heavily from ASU uh, for our internship program because it was ge uh, very close um, in geography. Great individuals. Most of them were very good at supply chain. So being in strategic sourcing on the indirect side complemented all the things that they were le learning um, uh, in school. So it, it is a mix. It's an evolution. Um, but I think you have to be open minded. And, and we as, as sourcing leaders need to hunt for those schools that do have supply chain and do our job to in, have interns and give them more visibility into what great things that we do for our companies and the value that that the department brings because we're really underrated. If we were a stock, we're very underrated. We're the best buy of the company when we're invested in. That's a really good point, Jaina. And I, I think that um, just not only procurement, supply chain as a whole, which of course in the past couple of months, we've seen that it's really, really showing its true self as a value center and not necessarily a cost center. But I always, you know, when I go into conversations with clients, I, one of the first questions I ask is your supply chain, a call center or a value center, because it's really about changing the way we look at, you know, different departments within supply chain. And to your point, Jaina, that will help us, you know, to retain more talent because it is seen as um, a really important and rewarding, you know, career because it brings so much to the organization. You know, a lot of people, studies have found, want to make sure that the work that they're doing is important and means something. So people tend to go for roles where they think they'll be able to have a really big impact. And I don't think that we have still gotten to the point to where people realize how important um, supply chain is and procurement and sourcing, you know, falling under that umbrella from my perspective. If you think of, you know, a source plan, make deliver um, being under your supply chain. Um, but kind of talking, we talked about recruiting challenges. What other challenges? Um, I'm sure you guys have plenty um, just over the past couple of months. I can imagine that some of you have been working 24 seven, you know, at some point. Um, so I want to kick it back to Siddharth. And what is, you know, a big challenge that you're either working through now or, you know, have recently um, kind of closed up and found a solution for? Uh, sure. Thanks, Ticey. I think this year has been, you know, phenomenal from a procurement standpoint. I've been uh, wherever I've had a chance uh, to share with, you know, folks. I've already uh, said uh, this has probably been like, you know, procurement's uh, time to shine. Uh, it continues to be because I think there is a lot of value add that uh, and and visibility that kind of suddenly came up for procurement, uh, and specifically in my area uh, because of uh, you know our company and how we you know have to deal with. Um, a lot of our, you know, members where we, you know, provide uh, vision care um, with our extensive doctor network as well as uh, retail network of optometrists and, uh, you know, um, eyewear stores. We um, had to uh, quickly uh, come up with a solutioning to, you know, provide PPE across this entire wide network of stores in the country, 700 plus stores, about 30,000 doctors. Uh, you know, it it's amazing, you know, March 15th, March 16th is when I think uh, we got the official order to kind of go home and, you know, work from home. 
and the next two or three months were absolute madness uh, trying to chase ppe across the country well at the same time everyone else is also you know chasing ppe so a uh, lot of you know like uh, good good success stories uh, some you know nightmares as well uh, with uh, shipments getting you know confiscated by the chinese by the vietnamese uh, and you know like you know left with you know finding uh, ways to you know replenish orders uh, you know packages land in our, at our dc and uh, you know it was actually overwhelming for our dc staff because you can imagine you know pallets and pallets of gloves and hand sanitizers and things like that you know just landing here uh, in some cases we had to actually go get certified to handle these you know kind of uh, hazardous or hazmat type uh, liquids so this year has been very very uh, you know challenging but uh, it's also been very rewarding as you see uh, you know our, you know we have uh, our entire retail network has uh, kind of like an internal chat group where they you know post pictures of uh, you know folks being donning ppe suits and helping customers and you know things like that so uh, you know going back to you know how i said you know it was procurement time to shine big uh, visibility with you know our c suite it kind of kind of like you know getting our place on the table uh, and uh, you know it's i think we mentioned this you know earlier procurement's all known about uh, you know cost savings and saving money this year kind of extended it to you know kind of saving jobs and saving people so that's our kind of internal motto is like you know save money save jobs save people uh, and it's been very powerful to motivate the team to um, uh, to kind of keep them you know uh, you know go go do this you know hard work around chasing suppliers chasing fda certifications things like that make sure that we get the right quality product to our uh, you know entire network uh, you know keep them safe and you know help them keep you know kind of doing their jobs uh, it's it's just been uh, you know rewarding i still continue to foresee you know us buying ppe through the you know next year unfortunately uh, but I, you know the good news is the supply kind of uh, constraints have kind of you know um, ironed out so it's a little bit more easier now to navigate uh, that uh, you know crazy world uh, but never in you know never i never would have dreamt of uh, chasing masks gowns gowns uh, you know uh, all the fun pp stuff <laughs> when you think about indirect sourcing yeah one subject i uh, would like to intervene quickly here is that um, it's not uh, always on the radar screen but it's sustainability management so uh, i see titles now going around um, in procurement organization where they don't call themselves anymore uh, procurement but is on, on the sourcing but is really driven by uh, innovation and sustainability so uh, um, maybe the trend should go into the innovation and and sustainability um, because when you go into sustainability you're going at what is right and you go beyond the pricing and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, statements that you can make behind that um and uh, except maybe california uh, there are many states in the us where it's very difficult to promote sustainability uh and and green uh, environmental values uh but if you go outside the us uh, it's very driven lately i mean if you do global business and if, if european companies if you don't have a statement sustainability you don't even get approved so um so there is a, a lot behind that and i think the world is changing and for those companies who are just driving by savings they will not make it um it will dry up it will become a bpo and it's over so um for, so that there's a lot of to, to be done and to be said here on what are the real values of the organizations we are building and running that's a really good point thomas thanks for sharing um michelle i see you smiling and nodding your head through you know what sadarth and thomas were both saying um what what challenges have you experienced or are experiencing now um or do you just want to weigh in on um on what they've mentioned i would say um for me and and this could be unique to the financial industry um those cyber actors out there i prior to covid it would be once every 6 months i'd be called in because one of our vendors had a cyber security breach and now it's every two weeks every two weeks we're doing block and tackle another vendor's been breached and we're trying to figure out the impacts on our business and 
so for me, that is the biggest single challenge and the biggest single change that I see since this whole March work from home. I think people just have more time on their hands um, and unnecessarily are necessarily are looking to use that time to figure out if they can hack into places. And so it's, um, that to me has just been a fascinating phenomenon. I never would have predicted that out of COVID. I mean, we were predicting that in the industry, right? So in the financial industry, we do wa watch the dark web and well, not me personally, we have a team that does that and they watch for those kind of things. So we were ready and, but we never, I never would have expected that COVID and an increase in cyber breaches would have gone hand in hand. So that to me is the thing that keeps me up at night so far. We've been unscathed. Um, even though there's been a lot of breaches, we just don't keep a lot of information with our vendors that we would be concerned about. But if you think of Target, right, in 2013, here we are now facing this on a regular basis. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I'd be interested to know if someone has done the research of the correlation between, you know, yeah. more people being at home or, I don't know, there are more computers, I'm guessing. People are expecting that companies have not, um, maybe, I know we had a fire drill personally at work last week or the week before where we switched to two-factor authentication because we hadn't had it previously. Um, so now maybe it's that, you know, we're using more personal computers to do work um, because it was very abrupt. It was, you know, as Sadar said, now everyone's at home tomorrow. You know, companies didn't really have the chance to roll out, you know, these cybersecurity features. Um, so I'd be interested to know if, you know, anyone has found a, a cause or correlation. So we have got challenges in, you know, sustainably sourcing, sustainability, um, which is very relevant. We've been hearing a lot of talk about the circular economy and, and sustainable supply chain recently. Um, cyber attacks and security definitely going along with risk management, um, sourcing and procurement. Even our panelists have also, uh, I was, you know, our, our attendees have said, you know, 10 masks yearly for cleaning previously. Now they're sourcing 5,000 per month. Um, so Jaina, what's, what's your challenge? What are, what are you guys seeing uh, um, a lot of right now? Um, actually for COVID for, I'm in hospitality, was in hospitality. Um, COVID was a real interesting challenge on the, on the direct side, yes. I mean, containers worth of hand sanitizers, um, that were in the casino business, were being ordered. On the other side of the, the office, um, where my team just did a ton of heavy lifting, if you can imagine, there's so many services that we buy to support hospitality that has a monthly reoccurring fee. Whether you're talking Wi-Fi, whether you're talking direct TV, um, those things, we had all our, our properties shut down. So my sourcing team really had to do a lot of heavy lifting, getting on the phone with suppliers saying, I'm dark, I don't want to pay. And it was like negotiation after negotiation. Then wave two became really heavy in that we tried to negotiate longer terms to conserve cash flow because we weren't having, none of our properties were producing revenue. So we needed to try to conserve cash. So for COVID for us, um, yes, we had all the constraints everybody else did to find PPE to prepare to reopen. But also, how do we manage cash flow? How do we manage the contracts that we have monthly reoccurring fees where we're not using the service? When and how hard do you lean on those partners to drive value and return something um, of value to the company um, so that we are successful coming out of COVID um, you know, uh, and still be a, a resolute company. So my team was really, really put to the task of many long days of prioritizing and then also seeing what we could hold off paying just to conserve cash flow. So uh, COVID, uh, as I can tell, is, has not been kind to anybody in our business operations, especially for procurement. Um, it, it, one of the things that um, brings me to, you know, when you talk about the attributes of a sound sourcing, whether you're on supply chain or whether you're in procurement, um, whatever your level, you have to have a notion of customer service and that you're here as a service or part of 
an organization. You're here to serve and protect, right? Um, and that's when you see our true colors of all the hard work of our individuals. They would all showed up and they were there to serve. And um, I had a great, great team that did really good work. Um, there's another dimension that we don't really think about is that some category leaders in those special times, they have almost nothing to do. You take travel, for example. If you have a, a travel team who sources or manages a travel program, um, there's no travel happening. So uh, you take office supply. Um, we said, okay, have catalogs and so on. But there's a certain number of categories, depending on the industry that you're in, where those given buyers pretty much they have nothing to do. So now the question comes, do you keep them? Do you let them go? And if you keep them, wh where do you reposition them, right? So that can create also a... Uh, to Michelle's point earlier, you can you can use them for transferable skill sets and maybe move them into new directions. Some categories will completely disappear. I think uh, Sarah will agree with me that you don't need a printer, printing buyer, right? It goes into a platform. But there are many other categories of that of that nature that will come up in the coming months and years if they don't exist already. And uh, so, uh, but that again uh, can encourage to think forward and, and transferable skill sets. Absolutely, that's a very good point, um, Thomas. And, and that's um, a good takeaway, you know, reskilling people, keeping them in the organization and, and reskilling them. Because even as we're starting to have more tech in these platforms, um, you know, you, you might need someone internally to really understand the platform and be able to, you know, either train others or troubleshoot, things like that. Um, so we we are running out of time. Um, this has been a great conversation, a great discussion. I really appreciate everyone's insights um, and the transparency and candidacy of sharing um, your lessons learned and your challenges uh, and keeping the discussion going. Um, I want to wrap up with a question that was actually posed by an attendee. Um, and in so doing, um, when you answer the question, make sure you let people know how they can get in touch with you. Um, and if they want to continue the conversation offline or have any other questions. So Thomas, you first, um, procurement by chance or by choice as a profession? Um. I think in the majority of the cases, still by chance. Um, maybe recently it has changed, but very often, if you look back, it was mostly by chance. And how can people get in touch with you if they have any other questions to follow up, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, was it for me? Yes, for you. Oh, Tommy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you said it, I didn't. I, I missed it. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they have other questions or kind of want to continue the discussion? Oh, it's very simple. Just find me on LinkedIn. Okay, perfect. Um, and what about you, Michelle? Procurement by chance or by choice? Uh, I love a funny story. It is absolutely by chance. Um, and how I got into procurement was out of school. I wanted to be a fashion designer and my parents said, no way. No way. They had visions of me in a sweatshop behind a sewing machine. And so I worked for a couple years and said, I'll, I'll be the polite version. Screw you. And I opened my own fashion boutique with having no knowledge of sourcing. I had never even worked in retail going through school. So I just figured it out as I went along and never looked back. I was in sourcing from that point on. Well, fashion, I'm sure you would have done a great job anyway. <laughs> but we have to we have to keep our parents happy at times. Um, what about you, uh, Jaina? Choice or chance? Uh, it is 100% by chance. My first 10 years of my career, I spent in advertising, marketing, and sales. And I got an opportunity to interview at Ford to actually buy the sales programs that I was used to selling. So I was at the same table, just sitting on the other side. And I kept scratching my head like, did I sound like that big of an idiot when I was, but I came with insider information that said, I know what margins are here. And I, and I learned how to push back and how to break down a bid. And then I just got the bug 
And I, procurement is where I was always meant to be. I just took the long road to get here um, because it is, it is now my choice. And um, I am, couldn't be more excited and still to be part of this wonderful procurement procure, um, community because we do a lot of good work and I love the thrill of the deal in making sure that it has value. Thanks so much, Jada. What about you, Siddharth? Let's wrap us up. Chance or choice? I'm going to stay on the same uh, topic that, you know, it was uh, by chance, but I also have like a little fun story. So I'm an electrical engineer by, uh, you know, background, I did engineering for a while, and then I wanted to, you know, like do an MBA, switch to the business side. So I did my MBA with a focus on supply chain uh, and finance. The only course that I did not take at my university, the business school, was a course on strategic sourcing. And that's where I ended up. So, you know, it just goes to show, you know, the degrees in education can only like take you somewhere. The first job out of school, I uh, actually landed up doing uh, project management for like an Ariba e-sourcing deployment. And then from there on, just went on, to, you know, into uh, indirect uh, sourcing. And, and now, you know, I have responsibility for indirect sourcing at a company here. So it's just interesting how, you know, things just uh, play out. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to also let, uh, you know, everyone know, you know, please do, uh, uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. For anyone that's also interested, as I was speaking about, I was hiring for a category manager. And you can see, you know, the posting on my uh, LinkedIn as well. So if, if you uh, feel, you know, you're interested, please do connect with me, reach out. And, uh, you know, thanks again back to Daisy and Sarah for giving um, a platform to, you know, share my insights as well as uh, do a little bit of a selling to, uh, you know, see if I can land a category manager soon. <laughs> no, you need a sourcing advisor. I think we decided. Yes, sourcing <laughs> advisor. Yes. <laughs> we are there. We are getting Yes. There. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for sticking with us through this time. Uh, thank you again to the panelists for your insights. I'm going to shoot it back to you, Sarah, to wrap us up. All right, Dicey, thanks again for moderating and thanks for our panelists for joining us all over the country. We even have Michelle joining us from Canada today. And I also started my career in fashion, so I have a special connection with Michelle. Um, I started in runway, didn't actually own my own boutique and found myself by chance in procurement as well. And Sid, now I really want to go swimming after staring at your background for an hour and a half. <laughs> Um, so with that, I want to close out our event for the day. Uh, we will, this has been recorded. We will make the content available on demand if you want to go back and listen or share it with colleagues. Um, there's some really good insights and information shared. It'll be available on our website and on social media. Brandon will be sending out a follow-up email and note on LinkedIn to all the attendees as well with the link to the recording. And our next procurement talk is November 18th at 1 Eastern time. John Hansen is moderating our next event. So if you got value and found this to be interesting and want to continue to attend the event, we will see you next month on the 18th. So have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the rest of your week.